speak to you after the event. Hello, everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much for joining this webinar with University of Plymouth International College. So the webinar is for all of our agents in Latin America, in Spain. Um, and we do have, as part of a group on the call today, uh, some Spanish speakers. So if anything is unclear, then uh, we'll use English as a main language for webinar, but if you would like us to use Spanish, then please do let us know, um, and Nico and Amy can help with that. So let's start with some introductions. My name is Tim. I'm Tim Gutzel. I'm Director of Marketing and Admissions for University of Plymouth International College here in the southwest of England, and I will ask my UPIC colleagues to introduce themselves in turn, maybe starting with Nico, because he's top left on the screen for me. So if Nico, you could kick off and then pass the baton on. Hi, everybody. I'm Nico Staurenghi, and I'm the admission manager here at UPIC. Hi, everyone. My name is Toby Joseph Johnson. I'm the student experience manager here at UPIC. Mary. Hi there. <laughs> I'm Mary Yates and I'm the admissions coordinator here at UPIC. Hello there. My name is Amy and I'm one of the admissions officers here at UPIC. Nice to meet you all. And I can see we have other Navitas colleagues with us on the call. So Alejandro and Arturo, if you would like to introduce yourselves as well. Hi everyone, my name is Alejandro and I'm a student recruitment manager for Navitas UP, University Partnerships Europe, in LATAM and Europe. So please come to me with support with UPIC uh, and also for the rest of our colleges across UP. Thank you. Hi, my name is Arturo Segura and I'm the Regional Director of Latin America with Navitas. I'm happy to be here. Great. Thank you both. So as you can see from the agenda, we've got a packed agenda to go through with you over the next half an hour or so. We've done the introductions. We'll uh, introduce you to the wider team here at UPIC. We'll talk about entry requirements for a selection of countries. Now, we obviously don't have time to go through every country, but if there's more information you would like, if we're not talking about your particular country, please feel free to stop interrupt. Nico knows everything there is to know about all the other countries as well. So we can help you during the call or we can help you afterwards. We'll give plenty of time for questions at the end as well. So entry requirements and then admissions processes. We'll take you through all of that. We'll tell you about how to pay uh, tuition fees. Mary will seek to demystify the CAS for you if there are any sort of complexities or uncertainties about that. We'll introduce you to the various different programs and levels of study that UPIC has to offer. We'll tell you about some student success stories. Um, we'll describe how we may be able to support you in marketing activities and in other ways. We'll tell you about all the important dates, so application, payment deadlines, term, semester dates, and all of that kind of thing. We have some great new health facilities on campus, a new building. So we'll give you a whistle stop tour of that, talk to you about scholarships. Um, there's a virtual tour. So we can give you a kind of flyover of the university, of the college, of the city, give you an idea of how Plymouth looks, what it's like to live here and to study here. We'll talk to you about accommodation provision on campus and in the city, about our social media, and we'll do some questions and answers at the end. And as I said, give plenty of time as well if there are other things you would like to ask us. So to kick off introducing the team, you can see me there, Tim, Director of Marketing and Admissions. We're a small but perfectly formed team in the college. So we have to the left of the screen there, we have our admissions team and you can see Nico and Mary and Amy who are all on the call. Um, can help you with all kinds of admissions questions. We have Amber as our marketing and student recruitment coordinator and Sarah as well, part of our admissions team. And then to the right of the screen, we've got our academic and student services and Toby as our student experience manager who works with um, Jake and with Anita as part of that team. 
So um, fairly small team, but big advantages of that. Uh, if you have any questions for us at all, just approach any of us and we can answer the question or pass it on. Also, uh, with the admissions team that we have, we can give a very fast turnaround time at the moment. So usually less than 24 hours from application to offer. So we should be able to provide you with a, a very high level of service. Um, yeah, so that's that's the UPIC team. And as I said, we'll go through a kind of sample of entry requirements. Um, Nico, would you like to pick this up? Of course. At UPIC, uh, we offer a um, program for a free entry levels, foundation level, first year direct entry, and pre-master program for postgraduate. So we got some example for entry requirement, uh, like for Brazil foundation, we will need to receive evidence of passing certificate in Sino Media with grade six average. And of course, for first year, uh, we require slightly higher grades. So same qualification, but with grade seven average. For Colombia, the entry requirement for foundation is completion of uh, uh, bachillerato. And for first year, not only completion of bachillerato, but also at least 65% or uh, 3.5 average. And in uh, Ecuador, for foundation, we ask uh, for completion of bachillerato, 55% average, and 65% if it's first year direct entry. In terms of pre-master, for all our country, so the minimum entry requirement is a university level qualification that needs to be equivalent of a UK HND, higher national diploma. So uh, HND or a bachelor degree are, uh, are usually fine. And uh, uh, Tim, if you want to go to our next slide, I think there are more countries. Sure, will do. Thank you. And for example, Mexico uh, Foundation, we need to see evidence of bachillerato with seven average or eight. It won't apply for first year direct, direct entry. Panama, completion of high school diploma with minimum three GPA or 3.5 GPA for first year direct entry. And Peru passing Certificado de Educación Secundaria Común Completa for foundation, or if they want to apply for a first year direct entry, they need to show evidence that they've already done a foundation program or equivalent. And again, for pre-master, university qualification equivalent to a UK h and higher national diploma, or to a bachelor degree, if, uh, if they have it. For some program, uh, these are the generic entry requirements, but for some program, uh, we need to see also some uh, specific grade in specific subjects. So program that are quite heavy in maths and science, of course, we need to see some good grades in this subject. For example, a student applying for health and human sciences program, accounting, uh, we will need to good maths. For engineering, we will need to see good maths and physics. And on our website, you can see uh, all kind of specific subject that we need to see according to the program. For the English requirement, uh, the most common test that we receive is the academic IELTS. That for foundation, we need 5.5 overall with no less than 5.5 in any band. While for first year and pre-master, we'll need at least six overall with no less than 5.5 in uh, any band. If your applicant has got lower score than the one required, uh, so there are a couple of options. Uh, usually just before the September intake, we got the Foundation Plus, which is a slightly longer uh, foundation for a student who got five overall in IELTS or equivalent. Or we also got pre-sessional English program in summer uh, that they can be attending online or face-to-face -face on campus. And according to uh, how much your applicant need to improve in their English. There are different uh, duration, usually from two weeks up to 11 weeks. So even if your student has got an IELTS, but they don't meet our English entry requirement, please apply anyway, because we might be able to offer this kind of alternatives before they start the main program. 
Thank you, Nico. Um, we'll just pause there in case uh, there are any questions you have, any issues of clarity, or if you would like us to explain any of that in Spanish language. Um, any questions at this point? No? Okay, we'll move on. Um, do feel free to interrupt if you have questions or to use the chat function and we'll get back to you there as well. So Mary, would you like to describe the admissions process? Or Amy, uh, either of you, feel free. Thank you, Tim. Um, so you will see that part of our application, um, we always expect a, a CV. Um, if the student happens to have a study gap in their, their history, um, we may also ask for a personal statement and we may then need to further assess it with our academic board. But it, a study gap doesn't necessarily mean that the student is illegible. We will we will look at it. Um, we will look at each case. We also ask that with a previous visa refusal, um, the students submit any relevant documentation we will often send out a questionnaire, an immigration history questionnaire, and that gives the, the student the opportunity to answer all questions um, and another opportunity for the student to submit said documentation. Um, that again is then assessed by our academic board. So again, it doesn't mean that the student is not eligible. We just again, look at it by case by case. Um, you will see the third point there refers to discrepancies on a document, and that could be with a student's name or date of birth. Um, so we compare the passport and the academic documentation. We then may request further documents um, where applicable. That could be a marriage certificate or we may request other official documentation, but we will um, communicate to you what we need. We also ask um, that when communicating with us, that the most appropriate way is to do so via the your, your portal for the student and for the student to do the same. Um, it just maintains a, a continuous line of communication for all and will enable us to give you a um, an efficient and a quick response. Um, I think that's everything covered in that slide, Tim, I hope. Great. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, and Toby, would you like to talk about payment? I know you like money very much. Not that much, Tim. I know it's Christmas soon, but hey ho. <laughs> yes, absolutely. In regards to uh, payment information, um, we require 100% payment upfront for our pre-master's students. Um, for our foundation and first year students, they must pay at least a 50% of their deposit um, initially. And then the uh, next installment will be due um, in May, um, teaching week nine. So that will be sometime in the middle of July. Um, we do have payment plans within reason. So the payment plan is any point up until that deadline, they are able to make multiple payments. Um, as you can see, the deadline for January 24 has passed, but I think we are still taking a uh, few payments at the moment. Um, also, just to be aware, we also provide what, a service called NAV insurance, um, which um, almost is a form of travel insurance for the student whilst they're studying here. Um, and as you can see, there's some information there regarding commission and our academic fees for the 23-24 year. As you can see, there are 15,250 for foundation, 16,000 pounds 250 for first year and our pre-master's fee, as I said, 100% upon um, completion. So our acceptance is 9,500 pounds. Thanks, Toby. Um, any questions at that point? <laughs> Carlos, lo podemos escuchar. <laughs> no hablo español. Amy, Nico, can you help me? Was that a question? No, sorry, sorry. he couldn't, he couldn't no, hear. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's about the possibility of uh, payment in statements, but sorry, I was speaking in Spanish. No, no problem. We can answer you in Spanish if you'd like. Uh, do you still have a question, Carlos, you'd like us to help with? 
you you mentioned that uh, would be possible to pay in installments. No, within reason. So up until the deadline. Um, if they've paid fifty percent um, deposit for example their foundation or first year to join us in January, the next installment is usually due around March for the following semester. So essentially, the student can make installments up until that fifteenth of March. Does that make sense? However, yes, yeah, just to clarify, um, before we can issue a CAS, we would need the full deposit payment. So either 50% of the first year or foundation year or the 100% of the master. So um, they can pay in installments to that point, but we cannot issue a CAS until we've got the full deposit. Um, but in terms of once they're here, then obviously Toby and the team there can set up installment plans up to the date uh, where it's due. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're moving on to the CAS. Mary, demystify the CAS for us, if you would. Okay, so we're really lucky here at UPIC because we can actually issue the CAS from this office. So myself and Amy and Sarah and Nico can all issue CAS. Um, so the process basically goes that once the students met all the conditions, we will send out an unconditional offer for them to accept. As soon as they send back the acceptance form, which will also contain their provisional CAS, where they've got the chance to amend any details at that point or let us know that everything's correct. Once we've got that back and payment, of their deposit, then we can start the process towards the CAS. So for under 18s, there's an extra box um, that we need parent signatures and UK Guardian details. And we do verify those to make sure that the students have some support over in the UK for them. We also require a parental consent form and a birth certificate. So, but we will make that clear in our communications about what's expected. Um, we then will send um, the precast checklist, which is simply an online form, which the student will submit. Um, it's their last chance to actually give us any further details that they haven't told us about previously. Um, and that gets submitted online and goes to the university and then comes to us. We will then ask for if you're in a country where we require financial um, evidence for the UK VI purposes, we then will need a bank statement, which must show currently enough money um, for £9,207, which is the UK VI um, living um, cost requirement and any remaining first year of study fees. So for pre-master students, it's quite simply 9207. For the others, it will be whatever remaining balance they haven't paid, so the rest of the 50%. Of course, if they wish to pay more, um, then they can show less in their bank statement. So it, it's there is a bit of flexibility there, but we must have at least 50% of the, of the <clears throat> first year's deposit. That has to be shown for 28 consecutive days um, without a drop in uh, the income. And and it must end no more than 31 days prior to the date they expect to make their visa application. It has to include the contact details of the bank. Uh, that's one of the things that we find most difficult to obtain. And it isn't us being difficult. It's actually to help them avoid a visa refusal. Because if UKVI can't contact the bank, then unfortunately, it can lead to a visa refusal. So it's really important that the documents that we see, we check to those standards to make sure that your student student has the best chance of not getting a visa refusal. The bank statement has to be in their name or it can be in their parent or illegal guardian only. We can't accept business accounts. Um, if the statement isn't in the student's name, then we need a financial letter of consent. We've got a, a nice performer that we can send out for people just to put their own details in and send back to us. So we make it as easy as we can. We also have to have the birth certificate to make sure that they genuinely are related to that person as a parent. Um, if the bank statement gets through all our checks, then we will raise the CAS here and we request that the student then applies for their visa as soon as they get that CAS. The students must supply the same documents that were approved when we raised the CAS because it gives them the best chance, okay? Um, we require the students that, to let us know as soon as they get their visa application outcome so that we can then ensure that Toby and his team will get in touch with them and make sure that we know when they're arriving, we can expect them and they can we can welcome them with open arms. So that's the process there. Is there anything else we can, any questions you have on that? Okay. Thanks, Mary. Okay. Any questions before we move on? Anything any of our colleagues would like to add? 
Okay. So let me take you through Sorry, the range. I have a question about Sure, the, Carlos, please. The, the, the bank uh, is, uh, statements uh, in, in the Mexico case and Spanish countries must be translated when you apply for the um, visa? Yes. If uh, if it's not in English, we need official English translation of the bank statement or of the birth certificate, any document that is provided as evidence for the CAS. If they're not in English, we need official English translation, yes. Okay. Uh, and must be translated by, by a um, certified translator. Correct. Yes. It has to be official. So, yeah, by certified translator. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Okay. Any more questions? before we move on. Okay, so let me take you quickly through the programs that UPIC has to offer. And the magic number here is three. So we have three levels of study and we have three intakes during the year. So the levels of study are foundation, first year and pre-masters. And the three intakes are in September where everything we offer is available in January, when many of our programs are available, and May is mostly pre-masters programs. So the focus in May is on pre-masters. Um, the subjects that we offer, there's a very wide and growing range. So a lot of the things you might expect, but also some things which might be surprising and some things which are related to our location as well. So surprising, we have a Health and Human Sciences Foundation program, for example, which many uh, Navitas colleges and other pathway providers don't offer. Health and Human Sciences leads into nursing, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, lots of uh, areas related to different health professions. And then in relation to location, we are a coastal university, and that's reflected in the programs the university offers and in the university's excellence. So we're in the top five in the world for all things teaching and research in relation to marine. So we have marine, coast, ocean sciences, also business subjects related to that, like maritime business and logistics and supply chain management. Um, tourism and hospitality as well. That's uh, quite a popular option that we have at both foundation and first year levels as well as the things you might ordinarily expect to see, such as business, management, uh, computing, lots of engineering, uh, civil, marine, coastal engineering as well. And then pre-master's level. Pre-master's programs are all one semester programs. So they can start um, in September, for example, leading into the university's January start masters, or they could start in January or May, leading into the university's um, September start masters. And there at pre-masters level, we have programs in business and management, education, psychology, again, a wide range of options. All of the foundation and first year programs are two semester programs with one exception. And that one exception is the health and human sciences program which is a three semester program, but it does have a lower English language uh, requirement on entry. Um, no, sorry, that's not right, is it? It has a higher entry, Eng English language requirement on entry to the university's degree. So our three semester program allows that progress to be made, that higher level of progress to be made before joining the university's program. Um, Three master's programs or one semester programs. Um, what other things to point out there? So um, the one program as well that requires academic approval by a member of the university's academic staff is the health and human sciences program, where there would be a faculty interview. And then finally, that requirement for uh, comes from our government, which is changing some of the uh, laws around immigration so postgraduate students can no longer bring dependents with them as of next January. Okay, are there any questions on any of the academic provision or the intake points that we offer? Okay, 
So we'll move on. Student success. So this is this is really important. So we take great pride in this, but we have more than 85% progression of students from a UPIC pathway program into the university's degree. And we have more than 85% completion of the university degree program among students who join UPIC. And this is really, really important to us. We're not just here to take student fees. Um, and then if they pass or fail, we don't mind. That is absolutely not the case for us. We're all about student success. So it's all about maintaining those numbers. We'd happily have those numbers up above 90% as well for students leaving UPIC successfully and graduating from a university successfully. Also, we have an equivalent number of first class and upper second class degrees awarded to UPIC students as are awarded to international students who join the university directly. So that shows that we are genuinely adding value for students who join us, maybe from a lower level of study or with slightly lower grades. Uh, by the time they leave the university, they are performing just as highly in terms of the classification of the degree um, and also in their module outcomes. So our students have the equivalent module outcomes of home and European Union and other international students who join the university directly. So that's a really important point to make. We're all about student success here. We can't guarantee that someone will pass, but if students engage with us, there's lots of support we can offer in the classroom, outside the classroom, in terms of wider support through Toby's student experience team. So if people want to engage, properly make the effort, there's lots of support we can offer them to, to make sure that they are successful. Um, how can we support your marketing efforts? Well, there's lots of things that we can do. We have a new promotional video, for example, we're always very happy to produce specific flyers for, for any events you may be having. Um, we have a whole range of posters. We're very happy to send you paper copies of those or um, to send you PDF artwork for anything that we have or anything you would like to develop with us. Um, we have a brochure, um, which uh, can be in print form, or again, we can send that to you as a PDF. If there's anything we don't have but would be useful to you then please do let us know and we'll do everything we can to produce that if we can so lots of support we would like to provide with your um marketing efforts and then alejandro perhaps you would like to say something about that from the, the kind of the in in market perspective about our marketing support for agents yeah, so on that, basically, yes, please reach out if you are planning to do some campaign, if you need any materials from our side, please, and we will point you in the right direction. We will collaborate with the college, and uh, yes, if you need anything in particular that we don't currently have, we might be able to uh, create it through our design team. So yes, please, any any initiatives, any activities that you would like to run for to promote uh, UP and Plymouth, please reach out uh, to me in the first place and then we will take it with the college in particular and we will address your needs. Thank you. Toby, do you want to take us through the important dates? Yes, absolutely. So um, if you're joining, if you have students joining us in January um, 2024, uh, so not long, next month really, um, the last day of enrollment for undergrad and postgrad, as you can see, is the 2nd of February and the 22nd of January, respectively. Um, our pre-master's courses, so our postgraduate courses are only are a lot shorter than our undergrad courses. So that's why the last day of enrollment tends to be the first day of teaching, because uh, we want students to benefit from all the um, arrangements that we've put across. So they will receive an orientation guide that has details of when the course starts when the enrollment or orientation program starts, et cetera. As you can see, there's various uh, deadlines for CASES. Um, the 15th of de December being the latest one, as you can see, um, in regards to getting that CAS out for you so you have enough time to apply for your visa and arrive on time. Um, in regards to the standard application, um, the deadline for that has passed. That was the 1st of December, so last week, Friday. 
Um, the payment deadline, as you know, we're still taking some applications now um, and late payments. Um, so as you can see, 24th of November was that. Um, and yeah, the app deadline was the 10th of November. Um, but I believe the team are triaging one or two if, if everything is available. Is that correct, Tim? I think it is. Thank you, Toby. I think the important point to make about the dates is that we don't set these deadlines to make it difficult for you. We're just, we set the deadlines uh, to the time that we think we can get everything organized um, and that we can get the CAS out so that your students can make their, their visa applications and get themselves here on time. So we kind of count back from our start date and then work out how much time is needed to get everything to happen. But these are deadlines that we set and the same applies to the May deadline. So they're not absolute. We don't just say, no, nope, go away if uh, you've missed a deadline. If we can possibly help to get everything organized in time. So if you have an applicant who maybe doesn't even need a CAS um, or you think can get everything processed quickly, has all of their documentation in place, then please do reach out to us because we will be flexible around these dates wherever we possibly can um, and wherever we have a realistic prospect of getting everything organized for the student to join us on time. Mary, you've seen the new health facilities, haven't you? Would you like to give us a description of your tour? It's excellent. What I'll say is it's very close to um, the college itself. It's just about a three minute walk away. So just part of the campus um, and it's brand new state of the art um, building um, with incredible views. But quite apart from what's on the outside, then what's on the inside is amazing resources, um, uh, interactive um I don't know what the word is, but interactive um, computers. What's what's the word, Amy? Equipment. Yeah, there we are. Yeah. Um, or, if, or if you don't know the word in uh, English, uh, maybe <laughs> Amy or Nico knows the word in Spanish. What, what's the word in Spanish? This uh, kind of table device, bottom left, Nico. Um, I don't remember even the word in English now for this. <laughs> it looked like a giant iPod, but... Is it an X-ray machine? No. 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 So it's a it's a huge life-size computer screen and it's interactive. And so what they can display is the whole of the human body and you can basically zoom in. So if a student is doing a piece of research, for instance, on the hand, they can actually zoom in and actually find all the information. They can get different views, 3D views. It's an incredible um, piece of equipment. Um, and they have more than one of these on each floor. Um, but also um, one of the benefits is that all the resources are there so that if a student is, I don't know, struggling or they need to do a bit more teaching, the equipment's all there for them. So they don't have to book it in advance. Um, the, the tutors will be able to explain um, with the functioning uh, dummies and models and, and equipment there. Also, they've got um, wards set up so that the students would get a real life sort of idea of what it's like to work in a ward they've got podiatry suites they've got um, areas where um, so the paramedics um, and emergency scenes where they can go and, and bring all the different um, health and human science students together to actually deal with an incident as it were and bring their training to the force it's an amazing resource which our students will have access to if they're on the health and human, you know, human science course so incredible development this year for us Thanks, Mary. Uh, Toby, you like money, don't you? Talk to us about scholarships. <laughs> I like giving out money, apparently. So that's why I'll talk about scholarships. So we've got a few international um, academic, you know, scholarships available to our students when they progress across from us to the university. So from an, from an undergrad or a postgrad point of view, there are certain faculties that receive our students and also offer them some incentives to perform well academically, um, like Tim alluded to earlier in the presentation. We like students who not only join us, uh, but, you know, go on to succeed and achieve great things. And I'm sure most of you who are on this call can have testament to any student that you send across to a higher education provider that does well is always a good example for more student recruitment. Um, um, the student 
in the photo there on, on the left is called Gia. She joined us last year and she was one of the students that achieved the Academic Excellence Award. So she was the highest achieving student within her cohorts, um, thus leaving her with 50% of her um, next progressing year's fees, which is really, really good. Um, but not only is that available to most of the students, depending on what program they're studying, but we also have what we call the progression scholarship to certain faculties that this allows it to. So what the requirements are is obviously achieving over 85% in attendance um, across the whole year, academic year, as well as achieving a grade over all the grades over 70% average, and then they will be eligible for a £2,000 uh, discounted fees of their next semester. Uh, so yeah, these are progression scholarships available, and there's those are programs that we have available for January and May that will apply to these students. Thanks, Toby. Oh, exciting. It's now drone, <coughs> flight, drone flight time. So, um, Toby, do you want to launch our virtual tour, as sure. I mentioned before? So, what would you say in Spanish were your three key words for Plymouth, Amy, Nico? Just pick three Spanish words that best describe Plymouth. Hmm. Um, Oceano, because Plymouth is Britain, uh, Britain Ocean City. We are right on the ocean on the seafront. Playas in La Costa. There are lots of beaches around the coast of, of Plymouth and Devon that are really beautiful. Costa di Devonia. <laughs> <laughs> Any more? Um, it's muy central. Everything is very walking distance, very reachable because the university, um, there is one main campus, which is in the heart of the university, walking distance from uh, the seafront. So the accommodation is all over the campus. No need for bus pass, um, no need for other public transport. So very easy to walk from one side to the other of the city center and all the facilities are walking distance. How would you say student friendly in Spanish? Student friendly. Uh, acogedor para los estudiantes. <laughs> ah, you're cheating, Alex. It's your first language. <laughs> no, no, but that, that's a tough one, you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, but yeah, actually, Plymouth is such a nice, cheerful city. Uh, I think the people from there in particular are quite friendly. So, yeah, that's also worth noting. Right. Toby. Take us, um, on a, I, take us on a tour. Don't crash. I'll try not to crash. I think one other word I would say is conectado. So connected from, from, from that point of view, just because, you know, we've got ferries that come across from Spain. So Santander in Spain and, and um, Roscoff in France. So there's lots of hospitality opportunities in the city. Uh, we also have quite a few English language schools that actually welcome students from other European countries um, and they come and do like their summer school over here so it's nice and vibrant um, I think there's some kind of rating that says Plymouth is one of the warmest cities in the UK so at least from that point of view it's like home away from home from that from from that point um, but it's also you know very welcoming to international students um, quite a few have come through the college uh, one recently Laura who uh, finished uh, an undergraduate degree with us um, a couple of years ago, and she went straight from undergraduate to a PhD, which isn't very um, common at all. But that just shows the you know the input that she put into her studies, and it it was quite you know a warm feeling seeing how she grew and matured over the years of her study here. Um, I'm currently in the Barbican, looking over one of Tim's boats. You know, he says I like money, but hey. hey. He's more than capable, as you can see, of owning a few fleets of nice boats, as you can see near the Barbican. The Barbican area um, is actually a nice, it's home to loads of restaurants, pubs and bars. We're actually having our Christmas function in this pub right here in a few in a few days time, uh, which we're all looking forward to. Um, 
everything is quite central in Plymouth. Um, the different distance between Plymouth Hill, where sometimes we have our university graduations um, in September, and the university is probably just like a five minute walk. So everything is quite central. So in, reg in regards to um, affordability, uh, you, you know, st students tend to prefer um, our institution or the city itself because, you know, they don't have to pay too much for bus or trains to get into the city. Every All the accommodation is quite close and compact and, mm -hmm. yeah, very connected. I would so say. every connectado, yeah, did you connectado. just Google that, Toby? Uh, no, <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> so I, the, I think what you can see here um, is how close together everything is. So the university is a city centre campus. So um, the college is right on the edge of the university campus, just across the road from a train station. If you walk from the university through the city centre, you arrive at the waterfront, as you can see there, in less than 10 minutes so genuinely our students can leave the college for lunchtime go and sit in the sun on the hoe the grass area at the waterfront and be back for their afternoon lectures and all of the accommodation as well is within or it can be within easy walking distance there's lots of city center accommodation for our students um, but can be an easy walking distance and that's convenient it's also cost effective because um there's no need to pay for public transport to get from accommodation to the teaching rooms. Um, and it's time effective as well. So we would obviously not recommend this, but uh, a late sleeping student could get up at five to nine and still reach their first class for nine o'clock. Obviously, we encourage them to be in a university uh, library by six studying hard. But if that doesn't happen, they're not going to be living too far away. Um, what else to say, Toby? We have the train station just across the road from the college, literally two minutes walk. So students, when they arrive here on the train, um, are almost on the college doorstep. And also the coach station is in the city centre and, and no more than five minutes walk away. So once you're in Plymouth, very easy to reach the college, the university and all of the accommodation. What yeah, else? I think you. I think you've covered most of everything. I mean, all the buildings as you can see are in red are university facilities. So, some of our finance departments stay in Roy William Yard. We have a few at the Plymouth Marine Laboratory, understandably, because we're quite marine focused university. Um, the accommodation would be good to take a look a little look in here, so you can see what a room looks like. So, as you can see, this is like a little studio apartment. Um, there's also access to an ensuite bathroom in here. Um, we exit, we can come to another one that has shared facilities. So yeah, just an accommodation. As you can see, that's the kitchen. The bread isn't inclusive, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, there's, there's something for everyone here and we, us as a, as a college, we like to try and ensure that our customers are satisfied and that includes yourselves as the agents and you know how important it is to be very good at communication and ensure that you know, you're receiving a really good optimal service. Great. Thanks, Toby. I'll land the drone. But what I'll do is I'll share this link in the chat so in case you have anybody that's interested but would like a visual representation of what the college and the university is like they can you can take them on a drone any what? other final words in spanish you would like to share no we'll leave it with connectado then toby <laughs> okay anything more to say on accommodation or do you think we've covered that so as we said all very close to the, the college and the university campus. Um, very cost effective. So typical accommodation prices in Plymouth will be from around £100 a week. Um, you can pay more, but you can have a very high standard of accommodation for, say, £200 a week. You may well have a lovely room with a sea view for something that would be a standard London or Birmingham or Manchester rent. So very cost effective for accommodation. Um, 
you can apply for accommodation online through our web website. Um, we actually work with a preferred letting agent called Clever, Clever Student Lets. Your students don't have to use them, but they are very familiar with working with UPIC um, and being more flexible around what our students need, more flexible around um, arrival dates, about length of contract. Um, so that that is a good option uh, for your students. And then our social media channels. We try to be very active on social media. Um, so if you would like to take a look or point your students in that direction, we have presence on Instagram, on Facebook, uh, on Twitter, which I think is called X now, isn't it? Uh, we have a YouTube channel with lots of videos on there. Uh, we have a LinkedIn presence as well. So please do go and take a look um, at all of our social media and point your students in that direction uh, as well, because it's uh, it. We hope it is entertaining. It's also very informative. There's a wealth of information on the YouTube channel, for example, with pre-departure webinars and that kind of thing. Oh, FAQs. So what we typically do at the end of webinars is we know that we get some questions routinely. So what we'll do is go through these and do a bit of role play and ask the questions of each other and answer them. Um, if you have other questions, then please do feel free to ask them. Um, we have as much time as you would like to answer any questions you have. Um, so who would like to kick off? Who'd like to be question master today? I think that would be me then. So um, that's good because that means I can point the questions wherever I would like to. Um, Mary, is there an option to study online? Uh, no, unfortunately not. All of our courses are now face to face. Um, and so students are expected to come into the college on their timetable days. Um, so all face to face <clears throat> with the possible only exception to that, <clears throat> excuse me, being <clears throat> sorry, being um, a pre-sessional or online English course before their main course starts. So that's the only online course we offer is pre-sessional. Thank you, Mary. Um, Amy, no hablo inglés. Will I survive? Yes, we have a very multicultural city here, um, very multicultural staff body, I would say. Um, so, yes, I think you would survive, Tim, and we could help as much as possible where where a student is um, struggling with the, the language barrier and the culture shock. Thanks, um, Amy. I think fair to say a lot of us have experience of living abroad, studying abroad, working abroad. So we know what it's like. We know it's very exciting but also quite daunting and there's a lot to get to grips with. So we typically describe coming to UPIC as being like a soft landing. So um, our students are um, in, in UK terms, they're adults if they're over 18, but we understand that they may be leaving home for the first time. Everything's exciting, but it's unfamiliar. Um, so we are here to help with that. It's not like going straight into university where they could be in a class of 500 for a lecture and nobody takes any notice if they don't turn up we're small enough as a college to know our students and if they're struggling or they're not here we will reach out to them so we're not like their parents but we could be like their, their benevolent elder uncle or aunt um what if a student has a study gap nico is that acceptable uh, yes, uh, so we are very happy to consider students with study gap. Obviously, what we ask is that with the application, the applicant should also submit a CV to show us what they've been doing since the last time they studied. We have uh, started that date or all the activity, work experience, training, and the personal statement explaining why they decided to return to studies now and not earlier. And um, yeah, so even if your student has a study gap, please submit the application. And in some cases, in case of a large study gap, like an eight years or more, we might have to refer the application to our academic board with this document, personal statement and CV for uh, their assessment. But uh, please do submit the application, even in case of a study gap. 
Thanks, Nico. Uh, Toby, can students book accommodation outside Plymouth? Um, we always ask students to live within a commutable distance of Plymouth. Um, so by what by a commutable distance, what we mean is if they have a 9 a.m. lecture, they're able to travel from a distance that they can attend that um, possibly five days a week. So yes, you are allowed to book accommodation slightly outside of Plymouth, but anywhere where it's more, more than an hour's worth of travel, I would suggest no. Thank you, Toby. And do students have to attend class every day? Yes, absolutely. Um, not just class, but all the facilities that they are paying for with their tuition. So if they're able to access the library, if they're able to visit the labs or facilities, I would believe so, yes, they should be capable of doing so. Mary, can students pay their fees in installments? Okay, so to recap earlier, um, <laughs> so they can pay <clears throat> their fees up to, so before they arrive, um, we, they can pay in parts, but we can't issue a CAS until we've got their complete deposit. Once they've arrived, they can pay in instalments. They can speak with Toby's team. The main thing is to keep the dialogue going. So if they are struggling, they need to first of all go and see um, one of the student experience team so that they can work out the best way forward. But yes, um, they can pay in parts, but obviously they must meet the payment deadline that they, they are told about well in advance. So it's week nine, isn't it, Toby, of um, that semester? So yes, but the idea is to keep them um, to keep them talking to the student experience team to help. Thanks, Mary. And then finally, Amy, are there any opportunities for part time work? En español, Tim. Sí, por favor. Hay muchas oportunidades en, en la ciudad. There are lots of opportunities in the city. Um, podemos ayudar a los estudiantes um, y dar una recomendación. Um, so we will help the students. We will give recommendations. Um, es muy importante con el visa que um, los estudiantes pueden trabajar no más que 20 horas durante el semestre. So they cannot work more than 20 hours during the semester. Um, fuera el semestre pueden trabajar 40 horas. Um, so during their holidays, during the break, they can work 40 hours. Um, but they need to be really careful with their working hours in the semester. So no más que 20 horas during term time. Thank you. Correct. So I think that's uh, those are all of the frequently asked questions that we tend to go through. But is there anything else you would like to ask us? Something I wanted to add is that on our website, we've now got um, the ambassador platform. Um, so if students do have any questions, um, we have um, some of our student ambassadors are able to answer them from a student perspective. So feel free to put them onto our website and um, a chat um, box pops up. Um, so that's fairly recent, but a nice, um, a nice touch if students want to ask questions. Alejandra, anything you would like to add? Um, from your treehouse, you look like you look like you're living in. Sorry, it looks like you're living in a treehouse. Is that where your office is? No, not not really. It's just a background, fancy oh. background. I wish it was though. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you. Is there anything else you would like to add? No, nothing in particular, really, but just to highlight uh, what a nice city Plymouth is in what such a nice in such a nice location, surrounded by national parks, uh, coastline, beautiful coastline, and there are other places like Cornwall nearby, and it's well connected with uh, Bristol as well. So yeah, it's just a very nice place. I've been on holiday there uh, a couple of times uh, in the area, and it's super nice. There is, it's a fantastic place for, for surfers, for surfing. So that's also worth noting. And if you are interested in a course related to marine and ocean, uh, this is your place, really, because they have such a specialization in this kind of courses, but also uh, hospitality, tourism, and uh, health sciences, among others. So, yeah, just to, to highlight those points. Thank you. So, oh, we have a hand raised, Fernanda. 
Yes, hello uh, everyone. This is Fernanda from Mexico City. Hello. Uh, hi. <laughs> hi. Yes, this presentation was really amazing, and I I think that the quality of life in uh, in Plymouth is uh, amazing. But can you mention something about security because that is mm. something very very important for our um, families here in Latin America, and also uh, about the cost of life. Yes. I believe it's very accessible, no? So, uh, but but if you can give us like an approximate of uh, a monthly stipend for the students, maybe. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. We have to be really careful, don't we, with what we say about this, because we can never guarantee anybody's security, absolutely. But what we can say is that Plymouth is ranked among the top five safest student cities in the UK. So if we look at the data for the crime uh, rates in, in university cities, Plymouth is very much one of the safest in the UK, um, in the top five. So yeah, as I say, we can't give any absolute guarantees about security, but we can share the data that shows that Plymouth compares very well with other cities in the UK on safety security grounds. And then on cost, again, it's one of the top 10 most cost-effective student cities in the UK. Um, a large part of the cost is accommodation. So we have um, accommodation costs, which are a half or a third even of typical London accommodation costs. So uh, the accommodation, there's a lot of accommodation available and it is competitively priced. I think if we're looking at things like food, then it will be supermarket food prices will be similar across the UK, perhaps a little bit less than London and other big cities. Um, or if we look at things like public transport. So um, in a lot of university cities, students will have to pay extra every day to use for train or, or a bus to get from home to lectures. Everything you can walk in Plymouth. So there's no public transport cost, except perhaps if students want to travel into London, uh, which is about three and a half hours away by train, or they want to do more touring around the UK. But daily life in Plymouth, there are no public transport costs, really. So it's um, a relatively very secure and very cost effective student city. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Carlos, you have your hand raised. Yes, I'm curious about the the student uh, the foundation year can start uh, January, May, or September, right? Correct. Um, not uh, quite. No. So it would be. I don't think there are any foundation programs of a May start, are there? There Nico? are business. Ah, uh, business. business. Okay. Yeah. So Mary, Nico, do you want to elaborate on that a bit more? Um. So we'd we'd need to look at um the website to decide on which ones most of our well all of our pre-masters are available in um in may and january most of the pre-masters are available in september <clears throat> um business um is also available in so an undergrad in may i think tourism is in may also yeah, yeah. tourism is also available in may so for the may entry it's mostly pre-masters and those two undergrads and then for september and january um those are the other two main ones for all our undergrad courses um but the main protocol would be our website or just send an, an email in if you're not sure um because we can offer you know up to two semesters in advance so yeah so everything we offer is available in september um but essentially so if it's undergraduate usually think september if it's postgraduate then a may pre-masters start for postgraduate would lead on to a september masters in the university without a break so may might be the most convenient starting point for postgraduate programs okay the, but uh, if the Undergraduate students starts in May. How did they do to continue in the second year? Because the second year starts in September, no? So some of the programs, such as business, um, actually have a January start. Um, so um, it, they sort of marry up. So that's why we can only offer a few, because it depends when the uh, university ha also have intakes. So that's why we offer slightly limited um, amount of undergrads. But there, there are some available. Uh, and all masters. Uh, uh, programs are available 
all pre-masters programs are available for May and for January. So if they come in January, they would probably have a semester's gap before they then start the main program in September at the university. Um, but some will be able to start in September and go on to a January start program. It sounds a bit complicated, but the best thing to do would be to look at the program and see which routes are in, or if you're not sure, just send us a message. Okay. Okay, thanks, Carlos. Thanks. Any more questions? We've gone on so long that Nico had to leave us because it's past his bedtime. <laughs> Sorry, again. <laughs> no, no, please. No, you're very welcome. Uh, <laughs> and students coming for from business, for example, looking for a master degree, can can take a master degree in in computer science, for example. I mean the 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 the, the master program can prepare the students to transfer to another area. Uh, Not really, no. In that one of the big advantages we have is that when we issue an offer. It's for the UPIC program, so the foundation program, and the university degree program with a single CAS for visa purposes. So that means that if somebody comes to do a pre-master's, we're making them an offer for, in effect, a 15-month master's program that leads to graduation from the university. They need only one CAS for that and one visa for that. So they don't have to go home after the UPIC program, the foundation or the pre-master's program and apply for a new visa. They have one CAS that takes them through the whole period of study to graduation from the university. So that's a huge advantage. But one of the issues with that is that it's harder to change subject area within that program. It can be done, um, but we would need to make an argument for that on behalf of the student with the UK immigration authorities for that change, of course. If it's a slight change, of course, it's more likely to be possible. If it's a big change, of course, it might mean going back to the beginning and, and starting the whole process again. Okay, well, thank you. Any more questions, anybody? Thank I you for your questions. Question. Very interesting. Yeah, sure. Please, Carmen. Question. The logistic program is only for undergraduate uh, or is optional also to a master's degree? Uh, we have master's options in that area as well. So there's uh, international logistics yes. uh, and supply chain management. There's international procurement and supply chain management. Uh, there's maritime business as well at postgraduate level, which would include logistics element within that. So, yeah, it's both undergraduate and postgraduate. Thank you very much. Any more questions? I think we've covered everything in the chat that was there as well, haven't we? Okay. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I'll thank all of my UPIC colleagues. So thank you, Amy, Mary, Toby, uh, and Nico. Thanks, Alex, for joining us as well. And thank you all our attendees for your time, your attention, and your really interesting questions. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, in case you have any last questions, I'm going to do a countdown from five. And then I'll end the recording when we get to five. But please feel free to interrupt me if there's anything else you would like to know. Um, and have a great rest of the day. And we look forward to hearing from you in the future. So five, four, three, Thank two, you very much, team, and one. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you very much indeed. Take care. Thank you. Bye.